I'd like you to take the word of God, if you would, please, and turn to the exciting book of Acts. The Acts of the Holy Spirit, the continuing work of Christ in the person of the Holy Spirit. And we have before us, as we have our Bible open to the 24th chapter of Acts, these scenes that come from Caesarea by the sea. We've been listing the Apostle Paul defend himself, give his answer to those who have accused him. And we continue with this. And as we continue with it, I want us to find our way to the 24th chapter and we'll begin in just a moment with verse 22. Now don't get frightened. I'm gonna try to preach through the 26th chapter. Did you bring supper? (laughs) I'm gonna jump here and there because I wanna try to show you something. And gentlemen, I want you to do all you can to help me. I want to try to show you something. I want to show you how one part of your life is connected with another part of your life. And God and God alone can connect all the parts. Many times people get the idea when they're growing up as children, it's got nothing to do with the life they'll live as adults. But it has everything to do with it. And many times you think an occasional meeting with someone might even be an interruption when it really turns out to be an appointment God made for you. Sometimes when you're reading the Bible, you'd like to get in the skin of the characters who are moving through these scenes and see it from their perspective. Many times I've thought in my mind about what Paul must have looked like. We find from his accusers that he was nothing robust or magnificent to look at. And he didn't have a pleasing voice. But the whole thing that's going on in Caesarea is about God dealing with the Apostle Paul and how God is using him in the lives of the great men and women of that moment. And so let's begin and see where the Lord will lead us. We're trying to conclude this series of messages on the testimony of the true Christian. And we're dealing with the Christian and his message. Did you ever think that all of you have a message? All of us have a message. As Christians, we have a message. We may not be articulating it the way we ought to, but we have a message. You have a message. God has given it to you when he redeemed you. And so the Bible says in Acts chapter 24, beginning with verse 22, and when Phoenix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, when Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down I will know the uttermost of your matter. And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or to come unto him. So the scene is set here. Paul has now been heard by Felix, who's in charge at this moment, He wants to consider what's going on. Felix is a ruler, but he had been a slave. And the Bible says that he ordered them to let Paul have liberty. And with authority, he forbade anyone to keep Paul's friends away. I want to keep in my mind and I want you to keep in your mind while bad things are happening to the Apostle Paul and he's imprisoned and he's going to spend so many months and years in Caesarea on his way to Rome, God is also allowing him to be refreshed while that's happening. You see, nothing can really keep us from having what God wants us to have in our soul. And so his friends are ministering to him. They're coming to encourage him. 
And the Bible says in verse 24, and after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, judgment, righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might loose him. Wherefore he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. That's almost like a footnote God drops in this to say there were other conversations, no doubt more private conversations that Paul had with Felix. God lets us know something about the intent and motive of Felix. He really wants money. But God also lets us know about the intent of the Apostle Paul. And instead of spending a lot of time on this, I want to do this quickly. Look at Paul's message to Felix. He came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewish, meaning she had a better understanding of this Jewish faith. So Paul began to speak to him and he covered three subjects. I want you to notice them. He reasoned of righteousness. And no doubt in this reasoning, many things were dealt with. I want you to hold your place there and turn with me to the book of Isaiah because I want you to mark this Bible reference in the book of Isaiah chapter one because we're reminded again of how God made us. He made us to think and to be taught and to communicate, not just to be told something and forced to do something. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter one and verse 18, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And teaching and preaching the Bible involves reasoning with people. Being aware that people are capable of listening, capable of hearing, capable of making decisions. That all of them have a conscience that we are not to attempt to override. God has made us in a way that we can reason logically about certain things and build in the argument as we talk with them. And Paul, no doubt, is putting his whole heart into this. If you could see him, I think he's speaking with every part of his body, every bit of emotion he can muster together. There's a pleading and a reasoning in this. And God gives us just one word, righteousness, but in order to have the righteousness that Paul was preaching about, he has to talk about the righteousness of Christ. He has to talk about the imputed righteousness of Christ. He has to talk about the death of Christ, the burial of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. He has to talk about our sinful record and the sinless record we can receive when we have the imputed righteousness of Christ on our, on our part now that when we trust him as Savior. So he's reasoning with him and he's pressing on this idea of righteousness. And then the word of God says, the second thing he talks about is temperance. And this is quite a subject for a ruler to have to listen to because rulers can do as they please, at least under certain authority, recognizing their higher authorities in him and their were. He has his position ultimately because it's been granted to him by Caesar. And he's not ultimately in charge, but here in Caesarea along the seacoast, he can do just about what he wants to do as he sits in this seat of judgment. And I, I want you to use your thinking just a moment to imagine Paul talking to him about who controls his life. To whom is he yielded? all the decision making that he has to do and the only one who can truly guide him to make the right decisions. 
These things reflect the kind of message that we ought to be having with people. And then ultimately, the Bible says he gave him the third subject, and that is judgment to come. I stand corrected on this subject because I have said for years, or did say for years, that the Spirit of God's in the world to convict us and reprove us of sin, righteousness, and judgment, but not judgment to come. And I would use this expression when I mentioned judgment given to us by the Lord Jesus, judgment to come, but it was not judgment to come. It was the judgment of our sin on the cross Christ was talking about as the Holy Spirit would work in our lives to teach us and show us that our sin debt has been paid. It's been judged already. And Christ's blood paid our debt. But here Paul is dealing with a subject that reaches beyond that. He's talking to an unconverted man and he's saying to him, you're gonna face God someday. See, the only thing that we have to deal with ultimately is our own mortality. We're going to die. It's appointed to men once to die. The word of God says in the book of Hebrews, the ninth chapter and the 27th verse, that it's appointed to men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And I don't think we are reading here the whole story. We're reading what God wants us to know. And he introduces the subject matter to us. Just imagine how strongly Paul reasoned with this ruler about righteousness and temperance and judgment to come. I know it was that kind of preaching, fearless, courageous, bold, spirit-filled preaching. Now remember, he's, he's the captive, he's the prisoner. He's the accused. This is the person who in that arena is in charge. And Paul speaks up, and you and I ought to do it in love, but we need to speak up with the message God has given us. Every Christian has a message to tell. You already have this because of the work Christ has done in your life. Hold your, hold your place here just a moment and turn with me to the gospel according to Luke. This is what the Lord Jesus said to his disciples in the 24th chapter of Luke. The Bible says in Luke chapter 24 and verse 44, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Let's continue. And said unto them, thus it is written and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem and ye are witnesses of these things. May I put it to you another way when we come to the 48th verse? He says as he talks about it behooved Christ to suffer why all of this happened with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And then he said, and you have this message. You have it. You're witnesses of it. It belongs to you. It's your message. It's the message of every Christian. I could ask, do you have a story to tell? And the answer is yes. And it's a story of God's redeeming love for us. So Paul is called in before Felix and Drusilla, his wife, and he boldly preaches. This is where so many preachers of our Christian heritage who spoke to kings and queens of the past gathered their courage and strength to see this, this small Jew stand before the ruler and boldly declare to him, about the righteousness of God and the temperance and God's control of his life and the fact that he's gonna meet God someday and answer for everything he's ever done. Look at the response. Back in Acts 24 
And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled. That's out of character for a ruler. He trembled. Passionate preaching. He could see and hear the compassion of Christ coming through Paul. And he trembled. Why does God record such a thing? The writer Luke is writing this account. It is, oh, we almost come into the scene and stand at the side and we watch as Paul preaches and gives his message. And Felix listens. And there's so much intensity in the room. Felix hears him and he trembles. He's convicted. He knows it's true, but he does not respond to the Lord. Maybe today we would say he, he held on with both hands to the pew. And he wouldn't let himself surrender. And the Bible says he trembled and answered, go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Old time preachers preached on that particular expression and used it on a subject called the peril, the risk we run by postponing God. And you and I run a risk every time we postpone doing what God wants. It may be to us something not as serious as this and less significant we judge than this, but any time we postpone God, so much so that when God by his spirit speaks to your heart in a church service or speaks to your heart at any time and you don't surrender to what God is saying and agree with God and follow God and say, yes, you're right, help me with this. When you don't do that, then your heart is hardened. And God may use more severe tones to get your attention. First revival meeting I ever preached in was in the Prospect community up toward the mountains. And I remember the pastor invited me and they were all so concerned in that church about one man. And remember he attended church every service Sunday. And not only did he attend church, he tithed his income as an unsaved man to the church. But he would not get saved. It's as though the whole meeting was zeroed in on this man. His wife was a wonderful, lovely Christian. His son was a dedicated Christian. And they were all praying for him. Have you ever been in a church where someone focuses all their attention and people get together in heart real heart for praying for the salvation of some lost soul. It was like that. So much so that the meeting seemed to be less than any success they wanted because that man didn't get saved. And I know God spoke to him, but he didn't respond to the Lord. Two weeks later, it was an awful car wreck. Now this is where it gets mysterious beyond what I can explain. His son was killed in that car wreck, trapped in the car that caught on fire and his body burned. And when that happened at the boy's funeral, the man came to Christ. Now the boy went to heaven, but don't you know a thousand times in one secret place after another as he thought, I wish, because the boy was pleading with him, I wish a thousand times over when God dealt with me, I would have responded to the Lord. And that scene is taking place here and God paints it in words as Felix is hearing and trembling and then saying, go your way when it's more convenient for me. What he meant by that? We don't really know. But that's the devil's biggest trick, isn't it? When it's convenient, I'll call for you. 
And the word of God says that he communed with him. Then in verse 27, but after two years, Portius Festus came unto Felix's room. That means that Festus was replaced, or Felix was replaced by Festus. Now, Paul is the prisoner. He's in Caesarea. He's there now two years, and now another ruler comes. It's as though God put his man in a special place by Caesarea, by the sea, out on the coast of the Mediterranean where all the people loved to come. And he kept bringing people to him so Paul had the opportunity to give his message to them. And so the Bible says that after two years, Festus came into Felix's room and Felix willing to show the Jews a pleasure left Paul bound. Now when Festus was come into the province after three days, he ascended from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Then the high priest and the chief of the Jews informed him against Paul and besought him. There's a conversation going on in Jerusalem now. He has visited Jerusalem from Caesarea and the high priest high tells it to talk to him because they want Paul dead. But Festus answered, verse four, that Paul should be kept at Caesarea, that he himself would depart shortly thither. Let them therefore, said he, which among you are able, go down with me and accuse this man if there be any wickedness in him. And when he had tarried among them more than 10 days, he went down into Caesarea and the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, commanded Paul to be brought. I want you to go back into the room. A different man sits on the judgment seat. His name is Festus, not Felix. And when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul which they could not prove. While he answered for himself neither against the law or the Jews, neither against the temple nor against Caesar have I offended anything at all. But Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, answered Paul and said, Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem and there be judged of these things before me? In other words, we're going to go to their territory where they hate you and want to kill you and laid in wait to kill you. Will you leave Caesarea and go? And Paul makes this decision. And this decision is connected with what Paul said. He wanted to preach the gospel at Rome also. And so he says, then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong as thou very well knowest. For in if offender or have committed anything Worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things whereof these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. He knows he's a Roman citizen and he can go appeal before Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, Hast thou appeal unto Caesar? Unto Caesar? shalt thou go. Now when he said unto Caesar, shalt thou go, can you imagine what happened to these accusing Jewish leaders who wanted to get him in some private place on the way to Jerusalem or in Jerusalem and put him to death? Paul knew that. They'd sworn to it. As a matter of fact, you remember, some of them swore they'd never eat again or drink again until he was dead. I don't know how long that lasted. And so, and when they had been there many days, Festus declared Paul's cause unto the king, saying, there's a certain man left in bonds by Felix. Now, Agrippa, King Agrippa and Bernice have arrived at Caesarea. Look at all this happening there. Felix, Festus, and now Agrippa and Bernice 
This is part of the Herodian dynasty. And they're at Caesarea by the sea. And the first thing they hear about is this prisoner. It's amazing how God uses us to testify if we seize the opportunity. And so, and when they had heard and been there many days, Festus declared Paul's cause and the king saying, there's a certain man left in bonds by Felix about whom when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders to the Jews informed, of the Jews informed me to desire to have judgment against him, to whom I answered, it is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die before that he which is accused have the accusers face to face and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime laid against him. Therefore, verse 17, when they were come thither, hither without any delay on the morrow, I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth against whom when the accuser stood up, they brought none accusation of such things as I supposed, but had certain questions against him of their own superstition and of one Jesus which was dead whom Paul affirmed to be alive. Now, this, this explanation from Festus to Agrippa gets to the heart of the matter. They hate the man because he's a follower of the Nazarene. He's a follower of Jesus and he insists that Jesus is alive and they hate him for it. And they want to kill him for it. This power, this power in the resurrection of Christ, but this power in the opposition to it also. In verse 20, and because I doubted of such manner of questions, I asked him whether he would go to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matters. But when Paul had appealed to be reserved unto the hearing of Augustus, that's Caesar Augustus. I commanded him to be kept till I might send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said unto Festus, I would also hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, thou shalt hear him. Now, if a preacher tried to get an appointment with these kings, he couldn't have done it. But look what God did. So, this member of the Herodian family is going to have an opportunity to have a meeting, or rather Paul, to have a meeting with this king. And on the morrow, verse 23, when Agrippa was come and Bernice with great pomp and was entered in to the place of hearing with the chief captains and principal men of the city at Festus' commandment, Paul was brought forth. And Festus said, King Agrippa, and all men which are here presented with us, present with us, ye see this man about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought not to live any longer. And when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, God makes sure that's recorded, and that he himself had appealed to Augustus I have determined to send him, of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord, whether I have brought him forth before you and especially before thee, O King Agrippa, that after examination that had I might have somewhat to write. For it seemed to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not withal to signify the crime laid against him. That's easily understood, isn't it? He said, I hear I've committed to send the man to Rome and I'm supposed to write the charge that he's guilty of and send him to Rome and I don't have anything to write and you've got to help me. I've gotten to chapter 26, by the way. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, thou art permitted to speak for thyself and this is where I wanted to come. Please be patient with me. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. 
Did I say we all have a message? And he answered for himself. He reasoned with Felix on righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Now he's standing before King Agrippa and he answers for himself. I want you to listen to his tender testimony. How plain, how open, how revealing it is. I want you to think that you're standing in the room or sitting in the room and this is what you hear the great apostle Paul say. Please. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, <laughs> bound, <laughs> standing here as a prisoner, answering, and this is the way he starts. In other words, don't feel sorry for me. Don't pity me. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day. Before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. Now remember, this is in the same bloodline of the Herod who put the babies to death trying to kill Jesus. This is in the same bloodline of the man appointed by the Caesar to be king of the Jews. There was an Edomite bloodline in this, but also a Jewish bloodline, and he understood the Jews. And Paul is aware of all this. And he says, my manner of life from my youth, which was at first among my own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews. Everybody knows about how I grew up, which knew me from the beginning. If they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. In other words, you couldn't have been more extreme than I was extreme. You couldn't have been more Jewish than I was Jewish. You couldn't have been more in the religion of the Jews than I was in the religion of the Jews. Just want you to know where I'm coming from, Agrippa. And I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. In other words, when we give our testimony, we talk about our life before knowing Christ. That's what he's doing. And then he's going to talk about how he came to know Christ and what Christ has done for him. I must just read. In verse six, and now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, under which promise our 12 tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly mad against them. I persecuted them even under strange cities. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen, to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. 
but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which in the which I will appear unto thee. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. For these causes, for these causes, the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day witnessing both to the small and great, saying none of the things than those which the prophets and the Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. And when he thus had spoken, the king rose up, and the governor, and Bernice, and they that sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doth nothing worthy of death or bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, this man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. I just wanted to get this to you. I really was so excited about getting this to you that you have the same story and the same message. You truly do have the same message that the Apostle Paul has. All people come to Christ the same way. You have this message. In God's name, when are we going to just start telling it? Telling it. Let's pray, may we?